Hello, friends. Oh, gosh. Is it October 1st? Or maybe it's the second now. I don't even know the day. It's the second. Wow. How'd that happen? So, uh, um, yeah, I was just sharing with folks here in the Zoom room that this is like, um, we'll be away for the next few weeks, uh, going on a, a lovely journey to Bhutan and Thailand. So um, these next four sessions here on this channel will be with guest teachers. So um, look forward to those practices with them and supporting them. And uh, to those of you that practice with it uh, with um, on the YouTube channel, we'll also be able to hear those teachers. They're all True North Insight teachers, and and they teach in other places as well, I believe. Hmm. So I've put a link down below in this recording and here in the Zoom room to this book I'm referencing part of tonight, which is called The Five Invitations by Frank Ostaseski, beautiful teacher, discovering what death can teach us about living fully. And it's really good. There's, you know, there's things that are open to discussion, as we have been doing in another group that I taught this morning. Um, but there's a lot of beautiful teachings. Um, Frank is one of the co-founders of the Zen Hospice Project, and uh, uh, as well as other things, founder of the Meta Institute, etc. And uh, so, but his writing, he and his teaching, he he just. Oh, Got a lovely way, so slow and calm and just like exuding compassion and presence. Yeah. And, but in his writing, he shares so many, you know, he's been bedside with, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of people in their dying time and in their death. Um, uh, so he has so much wisdom to sh pass on from what's been shared with him and experiences and uh this was one i read about this week if you have this book it's in chapter five of the book uh, and uh so you might might check it out so i'll i'll pay it, paraphrase some and then just read some part so he's sitting bedside with uh, a person that's named lorenzo here and uh He's laying there kind of wrapped up, tangled up in this synthetic hospital blanket. I guess he was in the hospital at this point. Yes, he was. Intercom conversation there. And uh, and he's like turned, curled and turned up facing, facing the wall, the institutional green wall, as Frank describes it. And um, this man, Lorenzo, had become recently homeless and and has is dying from terminal what is terminal with lung cancer and he is really quite deeply depressed in a state of real resignation and just kind of cutting himself off and um in a few days before frank had met him he had tried to take his own life and so that put him into the psychiatric unit of this hospital. And since then, he's barely speaking to anyone since he'd been admitted into that wing or that part of the hospital. And so Frank went in and didn't, didn't say anything. He just went in and sat down quietly in the room and just sat there for he says 20 minutes and then eventually this man Lorenzo you know turned to look over his shoulder as he was curled up facing the wall and said who are you and I'm Frank from the Zen Hospice Project he replied and he said nobody has ever sat with me sat this long in silence with me before well, that is so touching do we have people in our lives 
do we have opportunities to just be in silence with each other and how powerful that can be. And even if you're not like interacting or making contact, like it's a practice you can do, you know, even in a public space, there's been other examples, Sharon Salzberg shares teachings of a group that would practice at, I think, at a Grand Central Station or something like that, like a, a really public, busy, was it that? Like that. And uh, where they just practice metta with like kind of pick someone out of the crowd and practice metta with this being in their awareness and incredible things happen. Uh, so kind of like that. I mean, Frank was just sitting there in silence I don't, he didn't say what, if he was practicing something, but it's very interesting to do that if you have an opportunity to just, you know, if you're in a public space and just uh, have someone in awareness and be in silence with them, you might be surprised. Anyway, so uh, this uh, this started the interaction with this man that had previously wasn't speaking to anybody was really withdrawn etc just being there wow that says a lot and then um and then frank says to him what do you want what a great opener what do you want and uh lorenzo says um spaghetti Frank says, well, we make a really great spaghetti at our place. Why don't you come live with us at the Zen Hospice Project? And Frank said, okay. And that was the end of their intake interview. I was thinking about this, you know, with the hospices. I bet it, I bet a hospice intake is not like that anymore. Maybe it still is at Zen Hospice Project. But isn't that beautiful? What do you want? That would make a great spaghetti. Come live with us. Okay beautiful and uh um he shares how well lorenzo had uh as we all do expectations uh around his life and identity and never imagined that he could be in this situation uh, a homeless or unhoused person he had been, I forget what he was, an educated man with interest in art, literature, philosophy. His life had spiraled downward after his marriage broke apart, lost his job and health insurance when he could no longer work due to his cancer. He was a very self-determined man who never imagined himself as someone who would one day live in the streets. And uh, yeah, so this brought him to that place of wanting to end his life and then this 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 uh reflection that is being shared here one day shortly before he died lorenzo called to called me into his room called frank into his room and said i want to thank you I'm happier now than I have ever been. And Frank says, bullshit. <laughs> and he said, he said that because, you know, not long ago you had told me you didn't want to live if you could no longer walk in the park or write in your journal. What was that about? And this, this wise teacher, Lorenzo, said, oh, that, he said with a shrug, that was just chasing desire. So wise. Oh gosh, you know what are what are we attached to that is like this is what makes my life worth living. If I can't do these things, then it's it's off. It's I'm I'm out. And and then Lorenzo continued and he said, No, it's not the activities that bring me joy, it's the attention to the activities. That's just all the things. <laughs> it's not the activity. It's the attention to the activities. He says, now my pleasure comes from the coolness of the breeze 
and the softness of the sheets. And he's happier now than he's ever been. Oh my gosh. There's something about dying that uh, can can do this, can really uh, strip away what is uh, false and, and awaken preciousness and the sweetness and the beauty and the joys of cool sheets and a slight breeze or, yeah, the coolness of the breeze and softness of the sheets. Wow. Uh, but this, this line just really, so much of this story stood out to me, but it's not the activities that bring us joy, but our, but the attention to the activities. This is, this is so wise. And it really, okay, the word joy is a problem in translation because we may be acculturated to the word joy, meaning exuberance, you know, that that's, that's joy is like joy. <laughs> it's kind of scary. Um, joy. <laughs> we think of, oh, that's joy. It's like really bubbly and blah, I don't know what. But joy in the Dharma is, uh, there's a few different words, but one of the common ones is piti, P-I-T-I. And this is a factor in awakening. It's one of the seven factors of awakening. <sighs> and it's, um, joy is not, is a difficult translation for it, but it is one of them. It, another part of the translation is, I have to get somebody in here, is uh, rapture is a translation for PT. Rapture meaning rapt attention, R-A-P-T, rapt, or, you know, when a beautiful piece of music or a sunset where you're just content, there's a, a joy, but it's not like exuberant joy. It's just wonderment or presence. Sometimes time slows down. Um, this can happen a lot in nature when we're paying attention. Uh, so in the seven factors of awakening, it begins with mindfulness, sati, as does most of the path. And that's just one of, like, just like the beginning ingredient. <laughs> it's just like, then we need to intentionally apply dhamma vachaya, which means investigation, curiosity. Mm. What other words? It's not investigation, like thinking a lot. It's like, what? <laughs> what is this? It's trying to set aside our the knowing mind that instantly categorizes things. Oh, I just remembered. I was driving the other day with our daughter, and we went past a farmer's field. It's autumn beginning here, and... How did it even happen? We're not quite sure, but she was just like, okay, there was like a leaf. There was kind of, it must have been attached by a spider web or thread or something above this field that had been cut. And this leaf was just in place, but dancing around. But the mind couldn't quite categorize instantly what it was. And it was just like, what is that? Like it was some kind of bizarre bird or it couldn't, you know, it's amazing to watch how quickly the mind tries to categorize, to name and be like, that's that. And that little moment of, wow, is that kind of, what? what is this? Curiosity. 
I've had this before sometimes with some critters that I can't quite put in a box. Like, is that a bug? Is that a bird? What's going on? I've never seen that before. Or, oh gosh, I used to love finding these when I was a kid. I haven't seen one in so long. Walking sticks, have you seen? We used to walk with it. It's like, what? It's a stick with legs. What's happening? So good. What's that other bug? Oh, praying mantis? That's another one that's crazy. When you're a kid and you first see those, you're like, what the actual? What is so fascinating? And your attention is so wrapped with it. Like, whoa. And, and you're just taking it all in, you know? Once we get into knowing mind and we just go, ah, it's a bird, it's a bug. And then we stop paying attention. So this quality of curiosity is what he's, you know, it's the attention to the activities that brings joy. And, uh, okay, so seven factors of awakening. I know I'm rambling a bit tonight. Mindfulness and then Dhamma Vichaya. Mindfulness and then curiosity. It's more embodied rather than in the head. It's just like waking up. What is this? How is this? Here's another digressing that just is wanting to come in. Ah, okay. Martine Batchelor is another Dharma teacher I've sat retreat with, and her practice as a Korean Buddhist nun was she wasn't Korean, she was in Korea. Uh her whole practice was just asking, what is this? That's it. Whole practice. And still is largely. Okay. So these two factors, mindfulness and Dhamma Vichaya, bring energy. When you bring in that second ingredient, if you will, of curiosity, it ups the energy. It clears away the hindrances as well. When, and then once this energy factor comes in, it brings piti, joy, this quality of joy where there's a brightness and energy, curiosity is still there, mindfulness is still there. Yeah. Hmm. Awakeness. And then that joy, energy and joy does not just keep rising into exuberance. It levels off into calm. Pasadi, yes. Calm. But you need these other factors for the calm to arise. You need mindfulness and curiosity, energy, and this bit of joy quality. And this gives all that energy so you can keep paying attention to this breath, this breath, this breath, this breath. And then this calm comes. From that calm, mindfulness, dumb, curiosity, energy, joy, calm, then comes concentration. So many people begin meditation and they think they're they talk about concentration. And I'm like, no, honey, that's not, this is not concentration. We're just mindfulness here. Just starting with mindfulness. Concentration has all these factors which give rise to concentration. So that's a little something to tuck in your pocket. From that concentration, the last factor of awakening is equanimity. Ah. Huh. So this is this quality that wise Lorenzo in his dying time wisdom awoke to and shared with us through Frank's offering here is the difference between chasing desire and real joy that comes from paying attention to whatever is happening. Someone just told me this morning of uh, they had to be like lying prone for a year because of a spinal issue. 
And they said it was very, they awoke to all kinds of different awareness and peace and contentment, the sweetness of like this, like a breeze and different quality of time and conversations with friends and all kinds of stuff. They said, you know, was not as bad as you think it would have been. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, so, mm, could we be happier now than we've ever been? Yes. Rhetorical question. Yes. Um, one of the ways is to pay attention. To all the things that we take for granted, so much we don't even know these, all of this is happening, and we're not really awake to it. The mind is just naming it, categorizing it, taking the, everything for granted, like this step. What? How awesome. Legs, feet, ground, this smell. This taste. Oh, here, have you ever done this? Where if you put your hands about here and then you close your eyes and then I'll just describe what's happening. You close your eyes and your hands are, I don't know, maybe they're six inches apart or some such thing. And if you can, keeping your eyes closed, very slowly move your hands towards each other and see, you're just going to touch your baby fingertips together. Slow, slow. Don't peek. They'll find each other. What? Feel how much sensation is just in that tiny amount of skin touching skin. So much. And then you can open your eyes. Do you see, that's a touch you feel all day, right? Hands are all over everything. But if you just awaken to that, it's like, what? That was a lot of sensation in that tiny little touch. Yeah, these little things, like that's, that's, that one blows my mind sometimes. It's good to just shake it up and do these things. Mm. What ways are we chasing desire and what, what ways are we awakening and really being curious and paying attention to each other, to ourselves, to this embodied experience, this life, this world? Yeah, so thank you, dear Lorenzo, for this teaching and for Frank for sharing it. And um, we have this gift of possibility to awaken um, before our dying breaths. It, that might be good. <laughs> it's also going to be good just to do it right before you die. No problem. So let's practice. Okay. Uh, so we can set aside distractions. Adjust your posture. I'm going to have a sip of my giant mug of tea. Mm -hmm. I was telling someone earlier, my mug says, uh, it's almost big as my head, and it says, sometimes I feel like I have my life together, and then I'm like, wow, that was a really nice 45 seconds. <laughs> it's a good Dharma mug. <laughs> someone gave that to me as a gift, and at first I was like, you're trying to tell me something. Uh, all right. Hmm. 
So seeing if you need any other movement or touch or adjustments to your posture. Any sighing breaths. And then giving ourselves this gift of arriving, landing into our, our seat, our posture, whether you're laying down or sitting, standing or walking. Perhaps it's helpful to feel with some attention on our exhalations to feel like we're setting down some heavy baggage. What are you carrying in your heart, mind, and body that isn't needed right now? What would it feel like as if it was heavy luggage that you just placed down and let the shoulders drop, let the hands relax. Feeling any unneeded tension just dripping like soft, warm rain off the face, across the shoulders, dropping off of the fingertips, down the spine. Softening the belly. Allowing the body to feel its weight. And the relationship of the body with the ground. Contact and pressure, texture. Weightedness. Firmness, softness. And then taking a few moments to feel into your intention for practice. Why, why do you show up for yourself in this way? What do you hope to receive or cultivate from practice? What do you hope to offer? to the world or cultivate from your practice.
And taking a few moments to feel into one of the foundations, the ground of this practice and path of awakening is our, our values, our ethics, our morality. We undertake these trainings to refrain from causing harm, to refrain from taking what isn't freely given, to refrain from speaking harshly and falsely, to refrain from causing harm with our sensuality and sexuality, and to refrain from heedlessness caused from intoxicants. And you may have other values you want to take a moment to reflect on. And then we'll begin our practice tonight with this first factor of awakening, sati or mindfulness. For some simplicity and clarity in the guidance, I'll refer to the breath as an anchor. If paying attention to the breath in a focused way brings more tension or stress and aggravation for you, you could feel the breath in a really wide, spacious way. Like a sphere around the whole body where breathing is happening in that space. If you want, otherwise you can just let the attention come to a still point, like center of the belly, center of the chest, or perhaps the nostrils. So let's all just choose one place now that feels most accessible and caring. And begin to feel your breath sensations at that one place. Mindfulness, sati, is also translated as remembering. So when the attention moves off of that breath anchor, we remember and we begin again. And now let's bring in this second factor of Dhamma Vachaya or curiosity, investigation of sensations to this experience of breathing that's happening. At the place where you're feeling the breath, that one pointed attention or that spacious attention. See if you can feel the beginning moment of the inhalation.
When we do this at first, the breath might feel a bit exaggerated or controlled. That's okay. We'll let, let it go in a few minutes. Beginning of the inhalation. And now, just at that one point of attention, feel the length of the inhalation and all the micro sensations that happen along just the length of one inhale. It's a whole series of changing sensations. Of course, the rest of the breath just follows along. And right, we're just turning the light of attention onto this portion of the breath for a few moments. Each breath. Now turn awareness towards the inhalation has a natural ending where the breath kind of turns and becomes the beginning of an exhale, the turn of the breath. And feel the length of each exhalation. A whole series of micro sensations that we call one exhalation. the end of the exhalation. Each exhalation has a natural ending place and then there's a little space before the next inhale begins. And now feel one whole breath, it's beginning, length, turn, Exhale, ending, space, next breath, whole breath. And I'll see if the awareness can continue to rest with this whole vast experience. Each breath is absolutely unique. Each breath never to be breathed again. And see if the controlling of the breath could just relax a little bit. Body knows how to breathe and awareness knows how to know the breath. Awareness is a light touch like a feather floating on a wave. The wave of the breath and awareness is just knowing lightly. Whole breath. And perhaps you'll notice how this curiosity has brought some energy to continue. 
energy that has dispelled some of the hindrance of restlessness or sleepiness. And then just float in the possibility that there is some joy here, some pity, some easeful happiness, rapt attention, breath by breath. It might feel like some energy or some tingling or some brightness. The other factors are still here, mindfulness, curiosity, energy, joy. Settling into calm, still breath by breath. If awareness has slipped away into other thoughts or sleepiness or planning mind, etc., simply begin again. Mindfulness, this breath. And after a period of time, turn up the curiosity, breath by breath. And the rest unfolds.
It's not the activities that bring me joy. It's the attention to the activities. And if we're feeling a lack of this subtle quality of pity, joy, or a lack of energy, we can reverse it and ask, are we still paying attention? Is there still this curiosity and investigation of the experience? And sometimes we need to just turn up that light, that brightness a little bit more, like tuning a lute. We tighten up the string a little bit, or sometimes we need to loosen it a bit. Life and death are of supreme importance. Time passes quickly and opportunity is lost. Let us awaken, awaken. I will not squander my life.
Thank you for your practice and thank you, Lorenzo. And I'll also put a link down below um, to Frank's site, but also to um, the upcoming New Year's retreat. I know who's thinking about that yet, but some people are. So um, check that out if you are looking for an in-person different way to experience New Year's. Be sweet to practice with you. And uh, I hope you're able to check out and support these guest teachers that are helping me by keeping and helping the Sangha by uh, continuing while I'm away. Uh, I thank you in advance for supporting them in, with your presence and um, practice. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. See you um, in November. See you in a few weeks <laughs> with the one of the things about Bhutan I'll just mention, which you might not know, but you might, is that um, they're part of their government uh, is that they, they talk about um, gross national happiness is something they measure rather than GNP, gross national productivity. They also, I imagine, monitor that, but gross national happiness. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for joining us 